uh, this time it is about interfacial phenomena, um, microcapsule stability. And I would like to remind you uh, the rules of how to participate. So if you have any question related to the presentations, please ask in the question and answer window and only use the chat for technical problems so that uh, we can have a uh, clear and easy communication. So um, in this case, we are uh, going uh, to have two, uh, two speech, one from Professor Stefan Rouge and the other from Dr. Lex Nunery. And I will be the moderator and animator, uh, Dr. Uh, Rocio Morales Medina. So, um, so as you know, because this is already the fourth webinar, this is organized by the Bioencapsulation Research Group Association. And it has already organized more than 80 conferences, training schools and industrial conventions. Now we adapted to webinars due to the COVID situation, more than 7,000 contacts, um, from 80 countries and um, which are really high industrial participation, uh, more than the half. And in case you would like to know more about uh, this group, please visit the website. And this webinar is also organized together with uh, the consortium and cap for health which is funded by the Euro European Union Horizon 2020. The project is uh, related to innovative sustainable encapsulation systems for improving human health and well being. And we are a member of eight, count, eight different countries, some of them in Europe and some of them in South America. If you would like to know more about this project, please just uh, visit our uh, website. And now I would like to introduce you to Professor Stefan Rouge. Um, who will give uh, the first talk. And he has already experience uh, in the industry, although most of the, his uh, uh, professional experience was in academia at the University of Kiel in Italy, at the University of Milan, and, and now he's professor in the Technical University of Berlin. He has been active in microencapsulation since 2005 and has a broad experience in encapsulation of omega-3 in spray dried emulsions, in materials, and also in physical chemical characterization of microcapsules. And also Professor Drush is uh, the coordinator of uh, ENCAP for Health project. So now I, uh, he will begin giving his speech and I hope you will like, learn, and enjoy. Hello and welcome to my webinar on interfacial phenomena and microcapsule stability. It is strongly linked to the previous webinar on microencapsulation by spray drying, but I will make sure to pick up all of you in case you missed the previous one. In this schematic overview, I have tried to classify the most popular techniques for encapsulation. We can see that in the majority of cases formulation occurs on the liquid state. In the case of lipophilic materials, we therefore deal with heterogeneous systems consisting of multiple phases. For example, we deal with emulsions, multiple emulsions, multi-layer emulsions, microemulsions and micellar systems, solid lipid nanoparticles or complex coarsivates. The predominant technique for conversion of those systems into microcapsules is spray drying, spray granulation or extrusion. At least when talking about food, we mainly use starch conversion products as the bulk matrix forming material and thus we end up with an amorphous solid like capsule. The second major block is encapsulation in a gelled biopolymer. These biopolymers are also carbohydrate based, so we may take alginate or pectin as an example and we entrap the encapsulate by dripping, jetting or other techniques in a gel matrix which is either formed through thermal or ionotropic gelation. In my webinar I will focus on the first group of systems, 
sprayed right emulsions, but you may transfer the ideas to all other heterogeneous systems in which phase boundaries occur. So at the end, the system we are dealing with somehow looks like this schematic drawing. We have a bulk matrix, for example consisting of a starch conversion product like maltodextrin or glucose syrup. We have a dispersed phase, which is lipophilic in nature. Of course, we have some amphiphilic material, usually high molecular weight emulsifying constituents, which stabilize the emulsion in a liquid state. And we end up with a solid, uh, solid particle where the oil droplets are encapsulated and trapped in the carbohydrate-based matrix with some remaining non-encapsulated material on the surface of the particle. The story I'm going to tell you began some 15 years ago. There was a reasonable understanding of spray drying of dairy powders, encapsulation of aromas and functional ingredients became a growing market and there was a multitude of empirical studies out there. In those studies, the impact of oil drop size, oil load and process conditions on encapsulation efficiency was investigated and different wall materials were tested with respect to their functionality. You can see one example from our group, but there are several other same quality or even better out there. So I'm just taking those examples because they are most familiar to me. And as you can see, we, we are watching here or we are looking here at a modeling of a shelf life um, of encapsulated omega-3. So we are using the hydroperoxide content as a marker for lipid oxidation. And without going into detail, you can see that obviously the stability of the encapsulated omega-3s differed significantly between the different materials. So uh, on, in the upper part of the figure, we, we have gamma arabic uh, blended with, with some modified starch or either as an individual constituent. We have sugar beet pectin and caseinate as uh, emulsifying constituent of the formulation in different ratios blended with glucose syrup. And in the lower part of the figure, we have different types of uh, modified starch, either as an exclusive wall material for the encapsulation or uh, used as a blend with glucose syrup. And like I said, without going into detail, you can easily recognize that obviously um, stability was significantly affected by the material or by the emulsifying constituent we have been using. So... By analyzing a multitude of chemical and physical parameters, researchers made their way to improve our understanding of the complex interplay between materials, process and functionality. In the specific case we, we are currently looking at, we used a pattern recognition technique principal component analysis to identify the parameters which are the key to functionality. The small insert on the right hand side shows how those formulations we have just been uh, screening could be clustered and the so-called loading plot shows the part of the behavior which could be explained by parameters which are linked to the emulsifying constituent and oil droplet integrity. So if you watch the right hand insert of the picture, you can see that we got three groups of samples. Uh, on the bottom of the picture, you can see an OSA starch, which performed somehow different compared to the other samples. On the right hand side, you can see gamma arabic and sugar beet pectin clustered, which obviously behaved different uh, compared to all other samples. And if we go left to the loading plot, we now look at the parameters which are basically either on the left hand side or on the right hand side because they explain how samples in the small plot on the on the insert how those samples uh, which are right and left are um, separated from each other and as you can see all those parameters 
somehow are related to the emulsifying constituent we have been using. So it is the oil droplet size. It's the oil droplet size between uh, of the reconstituted emulsion. It is the non-encapsulated oil and it is the particle surface area which again is somehow related to the amount of non-encapsulated material we have. So basically this was a work which brought us to the idea that it is worth looking uh, to the interface, to the behavior of the emulsing fine constituent at the interface to somehow get an idea how we can optimize encapsulation of spray dried emulsions. So let's move closer to the interface. Basically, we can divide two major areas. The first one is droplet generation during liquid formulation in the process of encapsulation. The emulsifying constituent must be able to support formation of the droplet size distribution we aim on. In the second phase, which is basically the whole rest of the um, encapsulation process, we are more concerned about maintaining the oil droplet size and emulsion stability. Once it is produced, physical instability caused by flocculation, coalescence or Ostwald ripening may become an issue during storage of the liquid emulsion prior to spray drying. Pumping and atomization are pure stress for the oil droplets and may result in oil droplet disruption and recoalescence of droplets. Then finally, during particle formation, the liquid droplet shrinks and oil droplets come into contact, again increasing the chance of unintended changes in the oil droplet size distribution and development of non-encapsulated material. Finally, phase transition phenomena may induce leakage of oil and migration to the particle surface. And these phenomena include recrystallization of the oil or the amorphous starch conversion products we have been using. Altogether, a pretty good number of reasons why one should know what, what's happening at the interface. When talking about microcapsules prepared from spray dried emulsions, we usually talk about high molecular weight emulsifiers or their combination with low molecular weight emulsifiers. So we are talking about dairy proteins, we are talking about gamma arabic, we are talking about modified starch, or nowadays so we are also talking about plant proteins. The mixture of all of these high molecular weight emulsifying constituents or, as I said, a blend of them together with uh, some low molecular weight emulsifiers like lecithin, for example, or phospholipids, monodiglycerides. So there's a wide range out there. In theoretic models, different stages are distinguished for our high molecular weight emulsifiers. So, usually it somehow migrates to the interface where the molecules then adsorb unfold and start to rearrange and build up a network through intermolecular interactions. Of course, reality is more complex. For example, the process of droplet formation has a completely different time scale with a different flow regime and energetics involved compared to the model I have been presenting, but still we can learn something for the process from those models and also for the phenomena responsible for the stability of emulsions during storage and processing. If you're trying to get an insight what's happening at the interface, a very versatile tool in this context is pendant drop tensiometry. It is a rather simple technique, but helps to answer a wide range of questions. The basic setup is that you monitor the shape of a droplet with a high-speed frame grabber over time under controlled conditions. So in the middle of the picture you see a temperature controlled chamber. You see on the left hand side the high-speed frame grabber taking the pictures. And above the temperature controlled chamber you see a dosing unit and a syringe where you form a droplet um, at the tip of the needle of the syringe. 
When talking about taking pictures, we are talking about some hundred images per second, so you can monitor what's going on in your system on a very small timescale. From the shape of the droplet, one may calculate the interfacial tension, and this is the principal parameter we are using. In the case of a liquid-liquid interface, like in our emulsions, the droplet is generated in a chamber filled with the second phase of the dispersed system. The first thing we can monitor is the migration to the interface and the adsorption. To do so, we can use a two-fluid needle, like you see it in a schematic drawing on the left-hand side of the picture. A drop of water is generated at the tip of a needle and a low volume of emulsifier solution is injected into the first droplet. It will take some time for the emulsifier to reach the interface and thus we can first determine this lag phase, giving us an indication how fast an emulsifier occupies a newly created interface. From the decrease in interfacial tension or the Vice, uh, or the increase in interfacial pressure, we can calculate the adsorption rate, so how fast is incorporation of the molecules in the interface. You, you can see a typical result uh, on the right hand side, um, comparing a high molecular weight emulsifier like a protein and a low molecular weight emulsifier like for example our phospholipids. And as you can see, so we have a first the, the lag time, so the period or the time it takes for the molecule to arrive at the interface in the system. And then we, we have a sudden drop of the interfacial tension. In this case, uh, the plot is the surface pressure, so you see an increase. And we can fit a regression line to, to compare the slopes and calculate the adsorption rate um, from the slope of this regression line. A setup like this allows us to compare different emulsifying constituents with respect to their efficiency during stabilization of a newly created interface. To bring it closer to your daily routine, I brought an example. In this study, we investigated the adsorption of a milk protein, beta-lactoglobulin, at the oil-water interface. By changing pH and ionic strength, we modified the structure and electrostatic interactions between the molecules. So on the x-axis, you see pH 7, pH 7 and the presence of sodium chloride, and pH 9, bringing us a different state of aggregation of the protein and different electrostatic interactions. Furthermore, we investigated the influence of protein already present at the interface on the adsorption. So we have three columns, either occupation or adsorption uh, to the interface, where there is no protein present at the interface, and then two different levels of 0.001 and 0.01% of protein already present at the interface when the other protein is injected into the system. This is an important aspect when moving from a coarse emulsion to homogenization in preparation of an emulsion for spray drying. You already have an interface occupied with a protein and then you reshuffle the oil droplets, you, you make a fine emulsion and you have partly occupied interfaces with protein when new molecules um, may adsorb. Of course, pH 7 and pH 9 is not a realistic scenario for your products, but as I said, it is a model giving you the opportunity to investigate different protein structures using the same protein. On the left hand side, you can see the lag time, so the time it takes for the protein to reach uh, the interface. As you can see, without going into detail, we, we have an effect of, of pH and uh, sodium chloride on, on the lag time, and we also have a pronounced effect of the level of preoccupation. If protein is already present, uh, new molecules uh, have more difficulties to reach the interface. And on the right hand side, we can see the, the slope, so the rate of incorporation and adsorption of the protein at the interface. And we see an opposite effect that with increasing level of preoccupation, 
the absorption rate uh, dramatically decreases and uh, furthermore uh, if you compare the different groups of the columns we also have a very pronounced effect of uh, the physical state of the protein and the electrostatic interactions as modified by pH and sodium chloride. So if this system is not uh, convincing for you you can analyze in a similar setup anything which is uh, important in your formulation. For example, compare different gums uh, on their performance, compare gum arabic with modified starch or whatever your alternatives in formulation are. In a similar setup, you can analyze mixed emulsifier systems to see whether the emulsifiers coexist at the interface or if competitive desorption occurs. The way you modify the setup is that you first generate a droplet containing an emulsifier, as you can see again on the left hand side in the schematic drawing, and then inject the solution of the second emulsifying constituent. And on the right hand side we have a schematic drawing of the different scenarios. So first of all you can see that with a high molecular weight emulsifier, you get a certain reduction in the interfacial tension. Since it is a high molecular weight emulsifier, you usually have a much lower lowering of the interfacial tension compared to the low molecular weight emulsifier, which is also plotted as a red line in the drawing. At a specific time point when the system is stabilized, so when the high molecular weight emulsifier has stabilized at the oil-water interface, you inject a small amount of the low molecular weight emulsifier. And then three different scenarios may occur. If there is no change in interfacial tension at all, your low molecular weight emulsifier is not able to reach the interface and does not contribute to interfacial stabilization. If you get a decrease of the interfacial tension, it means that some of the molecules reach the interface, they somehow penetrate or fill gaps uh, within the protein network, and of course they will additionally reduce interfacial tension, so you see a lowering of the value. But the value will not reach the interfacial tension, which you have analyzed for the low molecular weight emulsifier itself because you have a mixed system. And only in the case that you have a full displacement of the protein by the low molecular weight emulsifier, as it is shown in the third case, you will experience a full displacement. So this is quite a nice way to see how a mix of emulsifying constituents may be useful to reach a more sophisticated aims in terms of stabilization and physical stability of, of your emulsion later on during storage. Moving on to the stability of an emulsion, you can monitor oil droplet coalescence and Ostwald ripening in a system like this. The experimental setup is modified in a way that you have two needles in the system through which you can either bring into contact or bring into close vicinity two oil droplets in a liquid environment of your continuous phase. You can then simply monitor either the change in volume over time on the right hand side in the case of the Ostwald ripening or you can monitor the time until droplet coalescence occurs to get an idea how fast physical instability phenomena will change your emulsion. Since phenomena like coalescence are also related to the stability of the or the physical integrity of the film of the interfacial film of the emulsifier, finally you can also use the system like pen and drop tensiometry to monitor the stability of the interfacial film. By changing the volume, you exhibit stress on the molecules at the interface. As a consequence, you will observe a change in interfacial tension. So, 
On the left hand side in the schematic drawing you see that we have a continuous cycling of the volume so we are increasing the volume of the droplet and then we are compressing it again or compressing the film again by reduction of the volume by sucking liquid out of the uh, droplet. As a consequence of the change in volume which of course goes along with a change in the interfacial area, you will observe a change in the interfacial tension. And as you can see on the left hand side of the bottom, this change can either be immediate, which we call it to be in phase with the change of the volume, or it can occur with a delay reflected by a phase angle. Results are frequently plotted in so-called Lisa Ju plots, which are shown on the right hand side. You plot the change in volume or the corresponding area from a two-dimensional image against the change in interfacial tension. In the case of an ideal elastic behavior of your molecules at the interface, you get a linear response with no difference between expansion and contraction. In other cases, like on the right hand side on the bottom, you will experience a linear viscoelastic or even non-linear behavior where your molecules deviate from those ideal behavior and give you an idea how processing or how stability during processing will be. Interpretation of those data also depends on the system and I will try to explain it again in a very general way. So increasing the volume of the drop means increasing the interfacial area. This is similar to drop deformation during processing. Change in interfacial tension and generation of a gradient in interfacial tension makes a droplet prone to disruption and coalescence. In a system with little interaction between molecules and high mobility like it is the case for low molecular weight emulsifiers, results therefore indicate how fast the interface is stabilized again upon stress. So if we look on the left hand side of our uh, slide, we have those low molecular weight emulsifiers. In the top part, we, we have a small droplet. You see it by the curvature of the, of the line. And up on expansion of the volume, you have a change in interfacial tension because you have less molecules per area unit of the interface. And the interfacial tension will stay the same or will, uh, will only experience limited changes if low molecular weight emulsifiers fast migrate from the bulk to the newly created interface, compensating uh, the change in area. In contrast, in a system with high intermolecular interactions, like on the right hand side, Increase in interfacial area and corresponding change in interfacial tensions allow conclusions on the elasticity of the film and the molecular interactions. So upon change of the volume and increase of the area, molecules, because those large molecules have, have a certain flexibility, molecules will expand but the interfacial tension will not change that much. A sudden change in interfacial tension will occur when film integrity is lost. And so basically, like in conventional bulk rheology, you can modify amplitude and frequency and compare different systems, how they react in terms of stress. Once again, to give an example, these are data from dilatational rheology of high and low molecular weight emulsifiers, in our case either beta-lactoglobulin or Kilaya saponins, QS in the figure. In the upper part of the figure, in the middle, you can see a nice elastic behavior of our protein, the beta-lactoglobulin. We have an almost linear shape with, with the same line or almost the same line for when going through a volume expansion and uh, compression again. 
In contrast, on the left-hand side in the upper part of the figure, you can see the viscoelastic response of the low molecular weight saponins. You have a huge difference in the response of the interfacial tension when going through an increase of the volume or a decrease of the volume again, giving us a kind of hysteresis which is typical for a viscoelastic behavior. In all other systems, you can observe a non-linear behavior with a linear response during expansion and a strain stiffening behavior during compression of the film. More deeply, interpretation of the results would go far beyond uh, the aims of this webinar, but I'm happy to discuss it with you later on or um, answer your questions and if you contact me after the webinar via email. If you are interested in the molecular interactions, you may analyze them in a more controlled two-dimensional setup using interfacial shearology. In a similar manner to conventional bulk rheology, you may determine elastic and viscous moduli of a complex shear modulus as a response to oscillatory stress. So looking at the left hand side, for this purpose you place a biconical disc geometry directly in the interface of a two-phase system and you perform time, amplitude and frequency sweeps. On the right hand side you see G prime and G double prime, so the two moduli, elastic and viscous uh, modulus of the system, plotted against the amplitude. And like in a conventional system or like in the conventional bulk rheology, you can now determine the linear viscoelastic range, so the deformation your system tolerates until irreversible changes in the structure of the emulsifying constituents film at the interface occur and you can draw conclusions on the strength of the interactions uh, by looking at the absolute values of G prime, G double prime and the complex modulus. Again, putting it into praxis, we are looking at an example for a spray dried emulsion this time it is a case study uh, which was done uh, from a colleague from Brazil uh, when she came to our department and they were interested in either chickpea based um, delivery systems or then chickpea pectin based systems. So we see here the elastic and viscous modulus uh, from shear amplitude sweeps of either CP, which is a chickpea-based emulsion, and CPHMP, which is an emulsion based on chickpea and high methoxylated pectin. Just looking at G prime, you can see that the chickpea pectin system with the black squares had a higher G prime compared to the chickpea based system alone. The difference doesn't look like much, but uh, remember that looking at the y axis you have a logarithmic scaling, so it was quite a pronounced difference in the system. Indicating that a system which is stabilized by, by a complex of chickpea and uh, high methoxylated pectin has much higher intermolecular interactions and um, is more stress resistant than the protein film alone. And like, like from our traditional thinking of how uh, those systems behave during spray drying, we were expecting that the system with the higher interfacial moduli and the higher molecular interactions will have the tendency or will be superior in terms of stability of the oil droplet size and the development of non-encapsulated material after spray drying. And as you see on the right hand side, the chickpea based system uh, had an oil droplet size after reconstitution of approximately 0.9 micrometers with an encapsulation efficiency of 89% and the chickpea pectin based system had uh, oil droplet size which was very close to the initial oil droplet size in the emulsion with 0.6 micrometers and an encapsulation efficiency of an acceptable 89%. 
So, at the end, uh, after those 30 minutes, uh, you now hopefully got an idea how model experiments using different rheological techniques and setups and uh, can help to understand and to predict the behavior uh, of your interfaces during processing and so give you a valuable tool um, to screen raw materials and to be more efficient in your product development. And that is basically also my take home message for you. So, to keep it very simple, selection of proteins and emulsifiers may significantly affect the stability of your encapsulated product or the capsules you produce. Molecular interactions within the film are crucial for drop formation and stabilization. Most of them, uh, surprisingly, are not really well understood and it is also, and we did not even touch the question how other bulk constituents uh, in the system affect the performance of your emulsifying constituents. So at the very end, to my opinion, there's plenty of room for targeted structure formation at the interface, um, giving functionality and also providing you the possibility to develop tailor-made solutions for your specific product improvements and development. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor Cruz, Professor for this uh, interesting presentation and uh, for linking the theory behind Spray Ryan and that ensuring that where all begins is at the interface. Now we have our second, um, and I would like also to mention that all the questions will be later answered by both uh, Professor Tush and uh, Dr. Nunari. So our next talk is given by Dr. Nunari, who had a PhD in material science and engineering, and he has devoted almost all his professional career uh, in the industry. He worked as a senior scientist in Pulkra Chemicals, and since 20, uh, 2018, he's working in Vertelus, especially focused in the production of the CMAC copolymer. And that's the topic of his talk. And uh, he's going to tell us uh, why this CMAC copolymer is so interesting for encapsulation is. Hope you enjoy and uh, learned a lot with his speech. Hello, my name is Lex Nunnery. I'm a senior polymer chemistry technologist at Vertelis in the US. And I'm excited to talk to you today about our ZMAC copolymer product line and how I can help you manage interfacial surfaces and obtain stable, uniform, monodispersed microcapsules. Before we get to that, I'd like to introduce you to Vertelis um, and some of the solutions that we offer. We are a leading provider in the world of specialty chemicals and we have chemicals that touch a variety of industries and can be found in many of the things that you use every day. We have a global team dedicated to driving customer success with smart chemistry solutions. And here are just a few of the markets that we serve and the types of products that we offer. So look us up. Um, so our ZMAC copolymer product line is used in many different applications. And one of them is uh, in microencapsulation. Uh, ZMAC copolymers are alternating co copolymers of ethylene and maleic anhydride. And ethylene is a small monomer, uh, the smallest that you can copolymerize with maleic anhydride in, in an alternating manner. And as a result, the, the uh, uh, functionality of the molecule is quite high. So the mass percentage of that maleic anhydride group is very, very high, the highest you can obtain of any alternating copolymer with, with maleic anhydride. Uh, we have two grades that are commonly used in microencapsulation. The higher molecular weight one listed here, ZMAC E400, is more popular. Uh, it's typically used by dissolving it in hot water where that anhydride ring will open, um, uh, adjust the pH, form a oil in water emulsion, and then make the wall. ZMAC copolymer acts like a colloidal stabilizer in that it helps you form the emulsion, the initial emulsion and hold that emulsion in place while the wall forming uh, occurs, allowing you to get coherent, uniform 
microcapsules. Um, in order to highlight the effectiveness of our ZMAC copolymer, we conducted the following experiment. We prepared microcapsules using two different interfacial polymerization wall forming chemistries, melamine formaldehyde and urea formaldehyde. We chose these because they're relatively popular uh, microencapsulation technologies. Uh, we compared our ZMAC E400 copolymer to three alternate polymeric colloidal stabilizers. These were two grades of polyvinyl alcohol and one grade of polyvinyl pyrrolidone. And the polyvinyl pyrrolidone and the polyvinyl alcohol molecular weights were selected based on their similar viscosity profiles to our E400 in water. Um, our study included two different internal phases. These were limonene and medium chain triglycerides. So we encapsulated both of them separately. And uh, limonene is a, is a fragrance, a model fragrance, and, and medium chain triglyceride is a, is a common component of many formulations, including cosmetic formulations. Um, you can see here the mass proportions and the procedures that we use to create these microcapsules. Uh, photomicrographs of the fully synthesized uh, microcapsules show um, and this is the urea formaldehyde systems. They, they show how the ZMAC copolymer is helping you obtain small, uniform, monodispersed microcapsules. And that's what you see here in the, the upper left-hand quadrant of, of either side of this slide, where, the, where only the ZMAC copolymer is getting you small, uniform microcapsules free of aggregation. There's one of them that looks like it might be acceptable. This is the partially hydrolyzed polyvinyl alcohol with the triglyceride. Uh, using the um, urea formaldehyde system. But what we noticed is that that formulation upon standing uh, seized up. So it formed a, a, a viscous gel. So that's something that you don't want. Um, and in some of the other cases, you can see clear evidence of uh, the microcapsules coming together and aggregating, which is undesirable. So only in the case of uh, <clears throat> ZMAC copolymer do you get small uniform microcapsules. It's important to note that um, the ZMAC copolymer is not capable of only obtaining small particles, but it is definitely capable of doing so in a way that many other colloidal stabilizers are not. So in, we've, we've observed that uh, the ZMAC is capable of small microcapsules, but, but it can also give you larger microcapsules as is in the case of uh, uh, phase change materials, uh, other kind of types of microcapsules. So the ZMAC is capable of a, of a very wide range of, of microcapsule diameters. Um, similar results were seen in the melamine formaldehyde systems. So only, again, only the ZMAC copolymer is enabling the formation and, and of um, small, uniform, monodispersed, discrete microcapsules. Um, what's interesting here is that in, in both polyvinyl alcohol systems, you see really serious aggregation problems uh, that are undesirable. And some of these resulted in an excessive increase in viscosity during synthesis, which is which is worse than on the previous slide where we had a gel upon standing. These are gels that are forming during synthesis, which is completely undesirable. Um, um, and so for polyvinyl pyrrolidone, we also see a mixture of large capsules and small capsules, and so that's a broader distribution. So only in the case of the, of the ZMAC copolymer are we getting narrow particle size distribution, no gelling. Um, so the particle size distribution can be represented mathematically by the what's the D10, the D50, and the D90. So the D50 uh, is the median particle size. 50% of the volume of capsules is above that diameter. 50% is below it. Uh, the D, likewise, the D10, the D90, that's where you have 90% ab above and below or 10% above and below, respectively. And so uh, these three dots that you see on these plots, that represents 80% um, uh, of the volume of the microcapsules. And then the middle dot is the median. So wh what I want you to notice here is that only in the case of the ZMAC microcapsules, and that's the gray, there's three gray dots in each of those plots, are you seeing a very narrow particle size distribution with a really small median? Um, and in all the other cases, you're seeing 
you know, a broader distribution, a larger median, and some of the extreme cases, remember I showed you on the uh, photomicrographs on the previous slides, in some cases we see severe aggregation. Uh, that's shown in the particle size distribution as a very, very large D50, a very, very large D90. And in some cases, in some of these systems, that, that measured value is way off the plot. You can't even see it here. Um, so again, only the ZMAC copolymer is giving you small monodisperse microcapsules. Um, so not only are they small, uniform, and monodisperse, but they also uh, have different properties as far as core retention. Um, what you can see here are plots of how much of the core fragrance, remember the limonene, the model fragrance, how much of that core fragrance is retained in each of these finished formulations upon heating, either at uh, 45 degrees C for 12 hours, or uh, a hotter temperature of 180 degrees C for 30 minutes. Um, and it's important to note that that 180 degrees C treatment is above the normal boiling point of the fragrance itself. What I want you to notice is that only these systems that contain ZMAC, um, used ZMAC copolymer to make the microcapsules are preserving the majority of that fragrance, both upon the 45 degrees C heating and also the 180 degrees C heating. Um, all the other ones lose more than half and sometimes practically all of their fragrance only on heating at 45 degrees C. Um, and none of them retain more than 20% of the fragrance upon heating at 180 degrees C. This is an indication that only the ZMAC in this study is giving you um, coherent wall formation and preventing the loss of the core material upon heating. Our uh, ZMAC copolymers can be used in many applications. Here's just a few of them that uh, you can see uh, inks, fragrances, phase change materials, we talked about cosmetics earlier. Um, many water insoluble liquids and solids can be readily microencapsulated using our technology. Um, so our ZMAC copolymers can be used in many applications um, and in many wall forming technologies. And so the focus of this presentation so far has been on urea formaldehyde and melamine formaldehyde chemistries because they're common. Um, what we've learned is that people have, have used these EMA copolymers um, in many different ways uh, with different wall technologies um, and they happen to work really well and including in, in formaldehyde free systems. And so um, what I want you to notice about this list is that uh, this, our ZMAC copolymers can play a role in many different wall forming chemistries. Um, the references are, are at the bottom are from industry and academic groups that use them in these ways. Again, my, my name is Lex Nunnery, I'm with Vertelis, uh, and I'm glad to have gotten to talk to you today about our ZMAC copolymers and how they can help you with microencapsulation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nunnery, for your talk. And now I would like to invite uh, Professor Drush and Dr. Nunnery to join uh, and open the microphone and the camera. And uh, um, Lex, could you please join? Yeah. Hi. So I have seen there's like a lot of questions and people are really curious about the uh, cell mac. And uh, specifically, they would like to know if they are, if it's, it is the biodegradable, uh, which is the food grade status in Europe. So maybe could you give a bit uh, broader answer than uh, what you wrote? Yeah, so there's, um, the first question was about indirect, uh, it was about food contact in Europe. And there are some limited applications for in, indirect food contact in Europe, but not direct food contact. So that's the first question. And then the, uh, the second question is about biodegradability. And, um, and this copolymer is not readily biodegradable by OECD 301B, I believe. And uh, that being said, though, it constitutes such a small proportion of the entire formulation that it's... Um, the, the other components in there are, are much more significant when it comes to, to ready biodegrad biodegradability. That is always a question. We have nice materials out there and they are not allowed in food. So. <laughs> Thank you. And 
also, uh, Professor Drush, there was a question uh, related to picketing and marching. And uh, it would be interesting if you could uh, share a bit more in detail with us. So uh, someone asked um, um, if we could use the techniques you have described in the, in the presentation for characterizing pickering and margin. Yes, uh, sure. I already answered in the chat. Uh, the, the problem is that we are now dealing with uh, solid particles. And uh, it may you may experience a problem that uh, those particles sediment before they uh, reach the interface. So uh, both in the independent drop as well as in the interfacial shear rheology, of course, a homogeneous formation of the film is a prerequisite for, uh, for, for an analysis. And this is sometimes not the case with the Pickering particles. So you, you need to try, but you, your success rate is, is somehow lower than with, with uh, conventional emulsifying uh, systems. Thank you. And um, I'm just checking. Now we have another question for uh, Professor Drush related to the microcapsule stability. Uh, if there is any rising state of the art of the methods that are useful to characterize the oxidative stability, directly or indirectly. Oh yeah, that gives us me, gives me the opportunity to start a second presentation, another thirty minutes. <laughs> Thank you for the question. <laughs> So, so, of course, uh, the, the most straightforward um, indirect way is to monitor lipid oxidation in your capsules, but I guess you do not want that uh, to wait that long uh, until you know, uh, until you experience the differences. So um, you were mentioning in your question something like pulse, which, which is a quite sophisticated technique and which, which is not really widely available. Um, the nice thing is uh, that um, pulse measurements uh, correlate uh, with the true density de determination. So if, if you do a uh, helium pycnometry and a BET analysis of your particles, you might already get some information on uh, how oxygen permeation uh, occurs in the material. And uh, from those physical parameters, uh, you can, of course, um, uh, start uh, your way uh, for evaluation of the samples. And in addition, of course, all the chemical methods uh, that you, for example, look at the antioxidative properties of, of the oil emulsifying constituents. Thank you for, for the answer. So now we will change again to Dr. Nunnery. And we have a question about uh, the size, like uh, the capsules we could produce uh, with MF or UF were really small, around 10 microns, but uh, what could we use if we need uh, uh, microcapsules uh, bigger, around 100 microns? So how uh, CEMAC could act in this case? So the, uh, the way that we achieved those small particle size diameters was that we applied a lot of shear to the emulsion before the wall forming event with a, with a rotor stator homogenizer. And if you, if you impart less shear to the emulsion, then you will end up with a, a relatively larger droplet size to begin with. That's the key thing. You get the, the initial droplet size where you want it uh, by, by a physical um, process, which in, in our case, we would have decreased the um, rotation rate of the homogenizer in order to achieve larger initial emulsion droplet size. And then we would have formed the, the walls the same way. And uh, there is another question related to CMAC. And is like, uh, do you have any experience to encapsulate biocytes with CMAC? Um, that's a new one on me. The biocytes, that's a new one on me. There, there are um, many um, oil soluble components that, that can be readily micro encapsulated by this manner that I've described. And so that's one of the first questions I ask people when they want to encapsulate something new is what, it, what are its characteristics in water? And usually uh, if it's relatively insoluble in water, you, you have a, um, a much easier chance of, of having a successful encapsulation of, of that component. If it's, um, 
if it's water soluble, then you're going to have a harder time doing it in the traditional manner. But there are some creative ways that are out there in the literature of people doing that. Uh, just just less common. Um, one of our panelists is helping and is also saying that yes, uh, CEMAT can be employed to encapsulate biocides. So we have already some people working in that topic, it seems. Thank you for the hint. And uh, in my case, I don't have more questions. Maybe, uh, and is there anyone I may miss? Um, no. So um, then I'm just checking again. So yeah, for in my window there, that's all. So I would like yes to thanks again, Professor Drush and Dr. Nunari for the nice talk. And uh, I would like to invite um, all the participants to join the next activities of the BRG group and the next webinars uh, that will be about microencapsulation in food in pharmacy and also microencapsulation by membrane emulsification. So thanks all of you for uh, participating and for the questions. Bye.